about eight months later, I was captured in Belfast in a van with a load of bombs and machine guns, myself and five other comrades. But when we were stopped by a British foot patrol, we jumped out of the van, there was a lot of fisty cops. We started fighting hand-to-hand combat and we got away. Everybody got away. So I was wanted for a long, long time until I was caught. About three months later, I was caught doing an operation. And at this time, Margaret Thatcher had taken away political status from all the prisoners who were fighting against Britain. They tried to make it into a criminal enterprise that if you fought Britain, you were a criminal. You know, as Karl Marx used to say, you know, if, if you're English, you fight the Irish, you're a hero. But if you're Irish, you fight the English, you're an outlaw. And that's the way it was. She tried to make us outlaws and be criminals, but we weren't going to have it. So when I went into Crumman Road Jail, the status was taken off, and I was sentenced to 10 years this time for having explosives and machine guns. And they put me in what was developed, just built by Margaret Thatcher, these new things called the hate blocks. Quite frightening. They were actually designed from the Nazis to put the Jews away during the concentration camps. This was the next phase that they had. They had these things ready, these hate blocks, and that was the same design. And she always boasted that these are, you can never get out. You, they're escape proof. Of course, years later, we proved that wrong when we had the greatest escape ever in Europe, European history, where 38 men escaped, you know. But the time in the hate blocks was horrendous. I was there for eight years. I was naked. I was stripped of all my clothes. As soon as I came into the reception, the day I was sent, they brought me into the reception. So it's like a room like this, six or seven screws waiting for you, wear buttons. And the first thing they do is they start ripping all your clothes off till you're naked, trying to humiliate you because you refuse to put on the prison uniform because you're not a criminal. I'm a political prisoner, as I told them, I'm not wearing it. So they just kept beating and beating and beating me, you know. And it was quite horrendous. And then I remember getting dragged by the ankles up a good uh, 20, 30 feet through tarmac. And the tarmac was ripping my shred. I'm completely naked at this time, you know. And so when you get up back into the blocks, you're only reaching the blocks now. And you've got more screws waiting for you. You've got the governor waiting for you. And because you refuse to say, sir, he also says you call him sir. I never called anybody sir in my life. My father says you call no man sir. And I say, because I refused, I got an hour beaten. And by the time I got into the cell, that tiny, tiny cell, the blood was pouring out of me. And that was my start to hit blocks for eight years. Naked. Does that fuel you with more fire? It does. With hatred and rage and... Not hatred. I would call it, I seek justice. During the, during the hunger strikes, we shot 38 screws dead. And I thought we should have shot more. I wanted as many, up 100, 200 of them dead. Even today... I check their names and see who's died, who's died of cancer or whatever. You know, I don't. I hate them so much. They got away, brutalizing us and torturing us for years. Got away with it. They got big bounty money, and they loved doing what they did. You know, and these are war criminals. How do you survive then, without either being killed or killing someone in there? In Long Cash? Yeah. Well, there were screws killed in Long Cash. I'm not getting into that, you know. Mm-hmm. But we killed a total of 38 prison guards, as they're called. I call them screws, you know. They were involved in the torture of political prisoners, naked political prisoners, you know. There was a lot more shit there, like, not shit there, but shit and survived. But for me, that wasn't enough. Some people said, well, it's a big number, 38, you know. But I wanted to be hundreds of them killed, you know. And today I still hate them because they got away with it. Don't hate British soldiers. They were doing their duty. That's what they were over here doing. I mightn't agree with what they're doing, really, soldiers, but they're over here doing their duty. They had no option, especially a lot of them come from working class areas, you know, especially in Glasgow or somewhere like this here, somewhere in London, poor areas in London. But these were guys who deliberately went and took this job as a guard, to guard political prisoners naked and to torture them. Torture me every day. I'm getting beat up every day, you know. You're naked. And you're talking about four or five screws coming into your cell. That's what you had to on for years. How can you forgive? You know, think about it. Yeah, that's rough. Think about it. Mm-hmm. You know? And was this, how many prisoners was this happening to? Well, it was 300 of us. I fancy at the start, there was only like 10 of us. I was one of the early blanket men. They were called the blanket men at the time in the H-blacks. What does that mean? Because uh, all they give us was this tiny blanket, very coarse. It's like a billo pad. When you put it on, it it was only like a tiny thing to put around. You were naked, except that there, and you know, it was supposed to cover your dignity. But it was a joke, like, and it was more torture, more because you couldn't do anything. You couldn't sleep because it cut right into your skin and all. 
So we got the nickname from people outside called the Blanket Man. And that was a, was a very famous, the Blanket Man. When you're a Blanket Man, you're very famous. People have an awful lot of respect for you, especially in the north of Ireland, you know. What yeah. about food? Food? Yeah. Well, the food was basic prison food, but you were getting all sorts of strange things on it. You can imagine, you know, these guys are feeding you as food and you know what they're doing. You know yourself, I don't want to start talking about what they were doing to the food, you know. But it's, I lost half my body weight. My father didn't recognize me eight years. I remember going out the gate after I'd done my time. And I remember my father waiting at the gate for me and he, and he was just staring past me. He didn't, I hadn't seen him for eight years. And he didn't know who I was. And my hair was way down my back. I was as skinny as that. You know, before that, I used to do weights and everything like this here. And he hadn't a clue who I was. And he just started crying. Never seen him crying. Only seen him crying twice. It was once a bloody Sunday when he thought I was dead. And that time when I got out of long case, and he was, it, it, it changed him. It broke him more than it broke me. Yeah, seen my father son. never got over because he thought my son was going through this. Well, you know, why did I lose? But there's nothing he could do, you know. But that's the way my father was thinking, you know, mm -hmm. as he should have been doing things. He had wanted to go out and kill the screws if he had thought he knew what was going on, you know. But it broke him. Were you allowed letters? Send anything out? No visitors? What was it? I never got a visit. I never got a visit, ever. And I hadn't seen my family when the day I went in until I got out about eight and a half year, years later, roughly. I never seen any of my family. Never had contact with them. Occasionally you may get a letter, but most of the time the screws would burn them or rip them up, you know, and send you an envelope and laugh. Say, oh, there's a letter if you, but you're not getting it, you know. It's this sort of nonsense, you know. So I had very little communications with my family at the time. There was one particular incident that always stuck out in my head when I was about eight. My mother walked out on us when we were kids and never, I never seen her again. I was eight years of age. I just walked out the door one day, never came back again. So I'd forgotten all about her. And I remember this priest coming down the corridor in the blacks. And I'll never forget it because any time you've seen these priests, the only time they ever showed their fucking faces was when they were coming in to say somebody had died. You know, they wouldn't do anything for you. Weren't there calling themselves priests and Christians, but they never done anything, you know, for you. So everybody's seen, we called them the angel of death because any time we're coming in, it's just to tell you somebody died and you always knew it was bad news. I was thinking, oh shit, some poor bastard's going to get some bad news here, you know? And then the next thing I hear him stopping outside my door, the cell door and the rattling the keys and the screws are screaming, get back, mother, get back. You no, know, because I stand at the door, you know? And the next thing a priest shows up, looks at me. I thought, Oh God, my father's dead, you know. That's the only thing I could think of, you know. And he turns and he says, um, sorry to have to tell you, but your mother's dead. I had no clue what he's talking about. I said, my mother? What are you talking about? She said, yeah, 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 she was found dead down in Dublin. And it took me about a couple of years later to try and get into my head that my mother was still alive at this time. I thought she died the day she walked out the door, you know, when I was eight. And here's this priest telling me now, nah, she's only dead now, you know. It made me quite angry at my mother being alive. She never tried to contact us, et cetera, et cetera, you know. So those kind of things, you had all that, plus the beatings and all sorts of psychological things. And it was just terrible, terrible things. I mean, you know, during the winter, I took out all the windows and you'd be freezing. And the, the piss, because you were, you, were, you were living in piss and shit because you weren't out of your cell. And we had to use the walls covered in shit. We were covered in shit. And when you pissed, the, the ice cold from the night was freezing the whole floors. It was just like an ice rink, and they, your skin used to stick to it, you know, because it was that freaking cold. I'll never forget the cold. And I used to think, God, kill me, stop torturing me, kill me now, nice. get this over with, you know, how far can I go? Because you were just getting tortured different ways every day, you know. How I didn't go insane was, it's unbelievable, like, you know, because you so could easily so just want to slip in your mind, you know, you would have went completely crazy. Did anybody ever kill themselves or wake up dead with the cold? Or no, starvation? nobody ever did. Nobody afterwards. Yeah, after afterwards when they got out, they couldn't handle men killed themselves, committed suicide. You know, ex prisoners and all. They just couldn't cope with the seeing things the way the world had changed. You know, and they hadn't seen their wives and kids in so long a time, so many years and all. Everything had changed. They couldn't cope. You know, plus the torture went on in their heads. What they got, I guess, like me, most of them never forget it. You know, we don't talk about it. Nobody talks about it. It's a problem. You know. Especially in Belfast, we, everybody regards you as a, a tough guy, a hard man. You shouldn't be talking about things like that. It's only for sissies and softies, you know, nonsense, you know. But that's how it was at the time. When did the hunger strike start? Was it 1981? Yes, that's when the, we had one hunger strike and it collapsed. 
the Brits agreed to give us our demands of uh, stop treating us like criminals and give us our clothes back, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you know. But once the hunger strike ended, they reneged. Margaret Thatcher reneged on it, you know. Ca caused a lot of problems. So the second hunger strike started, led by Bobby Sands and nine other men. And this one was going to be different because we knew that there's no doubt whatsoever Bobby and the other lads were going to die. We knew Margaret Thatcher was going to let them die because Uri Neve had been killed. Her personal friend, he'd been blown up by the ANLA and she had this terrible personal grudge against Republicans, you know, get for, for personal revenge, you know. If Margaret Thatcher hadn't been in charge, the, the hunger, there would never have been a hunger strike. It was through horror that men died. Horror determination to get revenge for Uri Neve, you know. Yeah, she was an evil bastard, she man. She was a very, uh, very evil woman. a lot of evil evil to Scotland as oh, well, man. Horrible of course. Un incredible what she got away with, like, you know, and uh, no, no comparison. No comparison and no sorrow for what she did, like, you know. She was a war criminal, but, you know, unfortunately she died in bed.